Hello everyone, my name is Agalia Ramkumar and today I want to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic and how global infrastructure has created a lot of inequality. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic caused over 6 million deaths worldwide and is having massive repercussions on the global scale. But finally, it feels like most of us are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. We're seeing a decline in cases, we're seeing fewer deaths, and we're seeing more people get vaccinated. However, the recovery from this pandemic has not been the same across the globe. As this graph now shows, the lower a country's income, the less access to resources they have. As the next generation of global health professionals, we need to find a way to address this inequality. And that's what I wanna talk about today. Before we dive further into the issue, let me start with a brief bio for myself. Uh, my name is Agalia Ramkumar and I'm a rising junior at International Academy West in Michigan of the United States. I'm a tutor and teaching is one of my favorite things. I work at an in-person center as well as a few online platforms, including Schoolhouse World. I also enjoy research, particularly with Mircor, a medical research group for high school students. Finally, I'm the founder and CEO of Compass for Careers, a nonprofit organization that provides everyone with accessible career education opportunities. Now, as you all know, and as a student myself, tackling these huge policy issues is hard for me too. So I've tried my best to break it down into a few simple categories. The problem, the origins, the previous attempt, and ideas for new solutions. So let's start with the problem. As I mentioned at the beginning, the recovery from COVID-19 has been happening, but not for everyone. Today, I'll be using vaccine distribution as the primary indicator of health infrastructure success because it was measured best globally. This graph shows vaccine doses distributed over time. The richer countries have had more vaccines from the very beginning, from the time when these vaccines started to become available. At the end of January 2021, high-income countries had an average of 5.6 doses administered for every 100 people. This is right around the time vaccines became available to healthcare personnel and people with compromised immunity. However, at this time in low-income countries, less than 1% of their population was vaccinated. Even worse, this ratio didn't improve too much over the course of the pandemic. A year later, at the end of January 2022, High-income countries had an average of 180 doses administered for every 100 people, which is almost two doses per person. Low-income countries, on the other hand, had only 13% vaccinated with one dose. Even now, based on the most recent data, high-income countries have administered eight times as many vaccine doses as low-income countries. Why is this important, though? Rich countries stocking up on vaccines early leads to less for poor countries. In the short term, this means more cases and deaths in those developing nations, which doesn't have a significant impact on the developed nations. However, the continued spread in those developed nations leads to more variants and ultimately more problems for everyone, not just the nations with spikes in cases. That's why it's important to acknowledge this issue. With proper health infrastructure, we could have avoided this whole situation, but instead we ended up with a bigger problem on our hands. So how did it end up this way? with the rich countries holding most of the vaccines. For that, we need to go back to the vaccine manufacturing and distribution process. When the vaccine was in the making, several rich countries invested millions in the research and development phase. In return, drug companies promised these countries a number of vaccines early on. This is known as a bilateral deal, and this is what gave these rich countries a head start. Richer countries got in line here, right when the research started. These vaccines may have failed in testing, they didn't really know, but these rich countries made the risky investments anyways because they had the money. As you might have guessed by now, less economically advanced countries can't afford to make these kinds of risky investments, so they usually start making their investments here during the testing phase. Even though poorer countries have a greater need due to population density and poor health infrastructure, they usually end up at the back of the line for vaccines. As we talked about on the previous slides, at some points, rich countries had enough vaccines to cover their population six times over, whereas poor countries hardly had enough for half their population. We did take steps to solve this problem though. The CEPI, the WHO and Gavi all came together to support COVAX, an initiative made to support countries that couldn't afford to make these risky bilateral deals. COVAX basically acts like a middleman. COVAX takes the money from these rich countries and anyone who wants to invest 
and distributes that to the vaccine manufacturers. This will drive down costs and fund the development of other vaccines. Then, as the vaccines became available, COVAX would hand them out to different countries so that everyone was covered by the existing supply. This new multilateral system allows different countries to be covered by the supply so that everyone is covered. Richer countries also get to make safer investments because they don't lose millions on a single bilateral deal. It also helps the poorer countries by allowing them to access vaccines at the same time as everyone else. This seems like a pretty good idea, but there was one specific reason it didn't work. COVAX was formed one month into the pandemic, meaning that many countries had already struck their bilateral deals and invested in different drug companies. Moreover, there wasn't much global infrastructure in place to get poorer countries the vaccines they needed. There was nobody overseeing the distribution of resources so without the management, we didn't have the infrastructure. We didn't have the plan to deal with this pandemic. And that's the fundamental issue with how we went about fighting this pandemic. We can't solve a global problem without global solutions. So what can we do to change our global infrastructure to be better prepared next time? First, we need to maintain an emergency response plan that includes all countries. As we talked about with the previous ineffective solutions, any solution that focuses on a single country or starts too late is mostly worthless. This plan could be started with disease response hotlines between countries, even those on bad political terms. A global pandemic needs to be fought with global partnership in a timely manner. Second, we need to maintain global stockpiles of important resources like PPE so that resources can be distributed when the need arises. The production also needs to be amped up in crisis mode with oversight from global organizations like the HWO or the UN. Strategies like COVAX can be applied to resources other than vaccines too, whatever may be needed in a future emergency. Third, we need to limit resources that have been pre-purchased and pre-committed to countries that have more than enough to protect their populations. Again, with the oversight of global health organizations, surplus countries should release their extra resources and give them to countries who don't have enough. Finally, we need greater transparency around existing resources and who they are committed to so that we can have reallocation towards countries that need more. This provides accountability for everyone. With these ideas in mind, we can put better global infrastructure in place so we're better prepared to fight future emergencies as a global community. Here are my references. And I wanna end with just a few notes of thanks. So first to my parents and family who have been a constant source of support with all of my projects. Next to my team and advisors at the Harvard Undergraduate International Relations Scholars Program who worked with me on my initial delve into this topic. Furthermore, I have to credit Mircor with sparking my interest in this subject and research as a whole. Of course, I have to send, extend a huge appreciation to the organizers of this Global Health Leadership Conference at John Hopkins for this incredible opportunity to speak today. And finally, I wanna thank the audience for their time and attention. Here are my contacts if you would like to work with me on a project or at my nonprofit. I'm always looking for new collaborators, so feel free to reach out via email or LinkedIn. Once again, thank you all for your time.